We're going to be in John chapter 2. John chapter 2. John chapter 2. The sun comes up, new day dawning. I, di- I didn't see that sun. Uh, I was looking out there. That was the start off. Uh, but yes, white as snow. John chapter 2. So this is our fourth week in John. Um, if you missed the first three weeks, it's okay. I'm going to catch you up. Jesus is God, and he's calling disciples. Here we are, John chapter 2, okay? And uh, Last week, we talked about a little bit of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And the reason we're talking about that is because we are to be disciples, followers of Jesus. That's what God has called us to be. So we, we don't want to get our definition of what a Christian is from the average American Christian. We don't want to get our definition of what a Christian is necessarily from the way we were brought up. Right? We, we don't want um, just to assume that we had the proper experience growing up of what a Christian disciple is, what a disciple follower of Jesus is. Uh, we want to go back to the Word with uh, fresh eyes. And so and if we're not careful, those of us who grew up in Sunday school can just say, oh, I know this story, John 2, water into wine. And we can immediately, make sure, we can immediately let our experiences and our traditions cause us to miss out on what the Scriptures have for us. Oh, I know what it is to be a disciple. Uh, it's to go to church three times a week or two times a week, and um, it's to tithe 10%, amen, and uh, it's to take communion regularly, and it's to um, read your Bible and pray every day. And all those things are great, but those aren't necessarily definitions of being a disciple or follower of Jesus. A lot of times we define discipleship, we define a relationship by our actions, and that's not the best metric. It certainly shouldn't be the only metric of how we measure a relationship. And so as we, as we go into this story, I want you to understand that this is about three days after Jesus called uh, some of his disciples, particularly Nathaniel. So last week we saw uh, Andrew introduce Simon, who became Peter, to Jesus. Andrew introduces Peter to Jesus. Then we see Philip introduce Nathanael to Jesus. And Jesus says, behold, a a perfect son of Israel. You're the best example of a son of Israel. Nathanael's like, you don't know me. He's like, I know you. I saw you under the fig tree by yourself. Nathanael freaks out. And he's like, you are God. And Jesus is like, that's it? That's all it took? Uh, You ain't seen nothing yet. And so now, three days later, these guys are following Jesus. He's a gifted teacher. He definitely has some perception. There's been an amazing thing that happened at his baptism. But they're still kind of wondering, right? We're only three days into a new relationship. What kind of guy is this, right? There's been a lot of false Christs. So did we throw our hat in the ring with the right guy? You remember Simon Peter forsook his nets and left all following Jesus. So he's following Jesus, and he, he saw the great catch of fish. But it's funny how even the greatest of miracles kind of wear off after a few days. You could have an encounter with Jesus, and you can walk out. And the flesh can start to question and tear apart every bit of that encounter, right? You can, the flesh always kicks back. So you're in church and you're like, man, that was the greatest service of my life. You walk out and the flesh is like, you were just being emotional. You're like, was I? I, you know, I I did cry. I was emotional. (laughs) There's a lot of tissue boxes in this church. So I, I, I I cried. Yeah. So you can, you can immediately begin to doubt because the, the flesh is very good at criticizing, critiquing, questioning, creating the seeds for skepticism and unbelief. So Nathaniel's like, did he see me under the fig tree? Did somebody tell him? Maybe he just has, you know, maybe I didn't notice. Who is this guy I'm following anyway? And so they go to a wedding. And uh, man, this portrayal of Jesus is so... uh, it's so unbaptist. Uh, I mean, let's just be honest, right? He's about to change 120 gallons of water into Welch's grape juice. Just kidding. Uh, and so uh, I'm pretty confident it's wine. And uh, because the Bible says it's wine, and because the people are really excited about the taste of this wine, I do have this theory that uh, this wine didn't come with the effects. Like the angry drunk, I think when he drank this wine, he didn't get angry. I just had this feeling. This is my theory. There's no scripture support, but it is wine, okay? And, uh, and he changes this water into wine, and we'll explain why. And if your Baptist antenna are going up, and there's like a glaring red light blinking in your head right now, 
because we're talking about wine. I'm just telling you a Bible story, boys and girls, and so it's going to be okay. I will not end this message with uh, now a, a, a commendation because the wine is not the point. So if you use this text to, to uh, uh, you either have to wiggle around it and say, you know, I think it was just juice, which is what I heard growing up, unfortunately, or you use this text to say, Jesus turned water into wine so I can drink 120 gallons of wine a week because this is what he turned into, then you, you missed the point of the story, okay? Both sides. You missed the point of the story, and, uh, and so we may, if we have extra time, which we probably won't, um, uh, uh, talk about that practically, but this is a celebration. This is a joyful thing. So let's read the story. We're going to read uh, 21 verses of chapter 2, and so let's read the odds together. Uh, Well, you start on verse 1 with me, and I'll read the uh, even verses by myself, or uh, of course the NLT, which is on the screen as well. Uh, Chapter 2, verse 1, ready. The next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him they have no more wine. What a, what a, a subtle um, a female perspective, right? Hey, Jesus, we're out of wine. Right? She just stares, right? She didn't ask him to do anything. She said, we're out of wine. Right? It's like um, when your wife says, hey, honey, uh, the trash can's full. Right? There's no command there, but it's implied. All right? Jesus, we're out of wine. <laughs> What, what, hey, hey, what does every guy do? What do you want me to do, right? I mean, this, is, this feels good to see Jesus right here. That's not my problem. That's what he says. All right, look at verse 4. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you, right? Do whatever he tells you. Hey, we're out of wine. Just do what he says. And, and then just goes, like, man, uh, uh, Mary, what, what a mom. Verse 6, standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings up the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After the wedding, he went to Capernaum for a few days with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. Verse 13, it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and cattle, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. Then, going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures, passion for God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What? They exclaimed, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you can rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he'd said this, and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. Two celebrations. We got two celebrations. We got a wedding, and we got Passover. The story has some parallels in it. Um, There's some question on John's chronology. So John is making a point that the three other gospels that are referred to as the synoptic gospels, because they're similar, He's making a point the other three don't necessarily make. He's writing his gospel later in life, and uh, he's writing this story to prove a point. We know Jesus lived. We know he was a man. We know he did uh, uh, great miracles, or there's stories of miracles that surround him. We know there's many witnesses of these miracles, but I want you to understand something. He wasn't just a man. He was God. He was the Son of God. And so he is making this point of uh, who he is. In the Old Testament, wine was a part of the celebration. 
Deuteronomy 22, uh, um, later on in the passage, I think it says, um, uh, after you have celebrated Jubilee and you have made a profit off what you've sold, uh, some things you've sold, you can uh, use the money, the profit, to buy whatever your soul wants, including strong drink. There is a, uh, there's a time for celebration, and, uh, and strong drink and wine was a part of those celebrations. Only after the work was done, only after the obedience, there was this time. Certainly, there was cultural differences between uh, those days and where we are now as a people, as a church, and as a nation. But that was a part of it. When you get to the prophets, though, like Isaiah and Jeremiah, particularly Isaiah, you see that um, there is an abuse of wine by God's people, uh, particularly the priests and uh, the people who serve in the temple, and then those who are kings, they are abusing it. Solomon had written a warning to his son and basically said, if you're a king or you're a priest, you want to stay away from it. Priests had to abstain from strong drink. Kings were warned to abstain from strong drink, but that didn't stop the kings or the priests. And so Isaiah warns of the priests who reel like like drunkards, staggering through their responsibilities and neglecting the sheep. And he warns of a day when the vineyards aren't going to grow any more produce and uh, no more grapes, and warns of a day when there won't be any more wine. He's speaking both literally and metaphorically. Literally, uh, when uh, uh, Babylon comes and they besiege the city and they burn the vineyards, you won't have any more wine. That's the literal meaning. But you'll also lose your reason to celebrate. You'll lose your reason for joy. You'll lose the joy of having God's presence in your midst. Yahweh is going to depart. He's going to take the ark and uh, he's going to depart. The temple will be destroyed and uh, uh, Solomon's temple will be torn down and burned down and your youth will be taken. Those who would normally celebrate in marriage won't get to marry because they're going to be taken out of Israel and they'll be sent to Babylon. There won't be any real wine. There won't be any presence of the Lord. That day comes. 586 B.C., um, in that, those couple years there, you have Nebuchadnezzar surrounding, besieging uh, uh, Jerusalem. You have him killing a king and putting another king in place and then taking that king, uh, gouging his eyes out and dragging him to Babylon along with guys like Daniel and uh, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He takes them to Babylon and you have 400 silent years. Yes, you have the temple rebuilt. Uh, it's a, 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 it pales in comparison to Solomon's temple. But Ezra and Nehemiah, they rebuild the wall, they rebuild the temple. But it's just not the same. And there's no open vision anymore. Prophets don't get new revelation. You have 400 silent years between Malachi and the birth of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No wine. No wine. There's no revelation. There's no function. The Holy Spirit's not really doing anything revelatory. We've got books that are written, historical books. You've got your reason for Hanukkah, the Maccabean revolt. You've got all that stuff in those 400 silent years, but none of it is found in Scripture. None of it speaks or, 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 or um, uh, portrays, prefigures, or foreshadows Jesus. All that's done. They're under a curse for those 400 years. And so when, when Jesus comes to this wedding, everything he does and everything that John tells us, see, there's 40 miracles recorded in uh, 40 different types of miracles recorded in the, script, in the Gospels, John only uh, 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 shows six, and he shows six for a reason. I want you to understand these particular miracles are signs declaring who Jesus is. These, because this miracle is a sign, it doesn't mean that we don't do miracles today, and we could teach that. We don't see miracles today. We do see miracles today through the Holy Spirit's function and ministry in our lives, and, 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 um, but the, the miracles that John decides to use are to build his case for who Jesus is. So Jesus goes, his disciples are kind of like, is he or isn't he? Like, I could still back out, right? Like, isn't there like a 14-day return on, uh, on your discipleship purchase, you know, your membership? Can I get a refund? And can, but can I keep the profit from the fish? You know, I, I'm not sure. So they go to the celebration. It's a great wedding, and then we're out. We got a few more days to go in the celebration, and we're out of wine. And so Jesus says, Mom, son, we're out of wine. You guys just do what he says. You know, and apparently she just kind of walks away from him. And uh, Jesus begins his ministry and shows his glory for the first time to the disciples by turning the water into wine. And we see this 
just um, beautiful symbolism. The wine is back in God's land. What do you mean by the wine? The glory of God has returned. The glory of God had departed from the Old Testament era. The glory of God had departed, and now it's back. And he takes, doesn't take the old wine skins or the old wine containers, but he takes these purification jars, these large stone jars that are for washing your feet, for ritual purification. He empties out the water, gets fresh water in them, and this is all about Old Testament law, right? Ritual cleansing and purification, and he turns that into wine. In other words, there's going to be a joy in being washed by Jesus. There's going to be a joy in being in his presence. The the burden of the law is going to be replaced by the joy of Jesus. The burden of going through all the cleansing is going to be replaced by a joy that's found in Christ's presence. And, uh, And so Jesus gives us a reason to celebrate, rejoice, and believe. So this first half of the chapter is revealing the new. This is a, a, a new era, a new ministry from Jesus, and he has a reason first to celebrate. This is a, a new covenant, uh, the New Testament of Jesus, right? The, the, uh, the new wineskin of what Jesus is doing. We also see a reason to rejoice, and this is that new wine. We can be excited, we can have joy, we can celebrate because of what Jesus has done. And then he gives his disciples a reason to believe. The Bible says this is when the disciples believed in him, right here. So John makes the point. So I I can just imagine John's been asked this question many times in his life. He's an older man now. And they've said, John, when when did you know? Like, when did you know that he was the one? And John says, let me tell you a story. Went to a wedding. They ran out of wine. Oh, man, what is it? I know it was a disaster. And you should have seen Jesus' mom. You know, John tells that story, and then he says, we watched him, and we saw the guy stand up in the middle, the, the master of ceremonies. We saw him drink, and he took one drink, and his eyes got really big, and he kept drinking, you know, and it kind of just flowed down his jowls. I mean, he was excited about this wine, and he turned, and there was a joy, and we, we were in awe because we saw the servants pour the water in, and then we tasted the wine ourselves. He turned water into the best wine we'd ever had. That's when I knew. I'm with you. This is going to be a wild ride. I mean, you talk about persecution, but I haven't seen anything like, like that. So far, you just make parties better. I mean, this is fantastic. This is the best wedding I've ever been to. We, we drank it all, and then you turn water into wine, and it got better. This is fantastic. I'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> I know, but the, the Son of Man must suffer many things. <laughs> yeah, 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 but the water and the wine. That's fantastic. That's when we knew. That's when we knew. Uh, can I just go off script for a second and just say, um, every, every one of us needs to have a time when we know. Right? right? These things I've written in you that you would know you have eternal life. That you would know that Jesus is the Son of God. That you would know that uh, he is yours right? and you're his. That you belong to each other. A lot of Christians don't ever have that. Right? How do you know you're a believer? Well, I was five years old. I said a prayer. That's great. And how, what fruit is that born in your life? Right? How do we know? There's a joy in serving Jesus. There's a joy in following Jesus. The disciples leave that day overjoyed by uh, this experience. This is what I knew is the one. So Jesus leaves. He leaves Cana, and he goes to Capernaum. And, uh, and from Capernaum, he, uh, he uh, spends some time with his family and then goes to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, it's time for another celebration. It's a celebration of an old, old story. All the way back in 1492 B.C., you've got the uh, Passover. So the, the freeing of the uh, Israelites from the grip of slavery and bondage under Egypt the last thing that breaks their back, it breaks the hard neck of Pharaoh is the Passover. The blood sprinkled on the doorpost. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. It's a celebration of that old covenant. We are God's people because we are the Jews. He brought us out of Egypt and he parted the Red Sea. This is who we are. We are God's people. And it was something they kept celebrating, but the problem was they weren't really being blessed like God's people anymore. They weren't acting like God's people. The priests were, were corrupt. 
they were tied financially to the Romans. God's will was not their will. It was Caesar's will that was their will. They were under the the servitude and captivity. They'd been under Babylon. They'd been under Persia. They'd been under Greece, and now they were under Rome. They were not God's people. They were Caesar's people. So having an empty, lifeless celebration. We're celebrating the fact that God spared us, but he's not sparing your children. He's not sparing them from seeing their dads crucified along the roads. He's not sparing you from the bondage of Rome. Oh, you were delivered from Egypt's bondage, but you're still in bondage today. You are bound in the slavery and servitude of Rome. You have your festivities. You have your traditions, but they're hollow and empty and lifeless. Where is God in Jerusalem? Oh, he's in the temple. Okay, Jesus says, I'll go to the temple, but I don't see God. I see money. I see idols. I see corruption. He sees a lifeless religious tradition. We're God's people. No, you're not. You're Rome's people. You're owned, and you're as much slavery now as you were in the days of Egypt, in the days of Exodus. This is a powerful and poignant moment. By the way, this is a moment where culturally different, but spiritually the same, where I've acted like I was God's person, but I was in as much bondage as some of my lost friends. That's really where freedom for us has started, has been acknowledging shackles, acknowledging chains. You can't get free until you acknowledge that you're bound. <laughs> right? A lot of Christians are like, I don't need that. And Jesus says, okay, I didn't come to, help, to heal the uh, healthy. I didn't come to heal the righteous. I came to heal the sick. If you'll acknowledge you're sick, I'll heal you. But if you won't tell me you're sick, I won't heal you. By the way, you're sick. I mean, how many times have you sung Jesus Paid It All and not been very excited about it? Right? Jesus paid it all. Yeah, when I was five, I got saved. He paid it all. Yeah. I mean, I'm still discouraged. I'm still in bondage. There's a lifelessness when it becomes religion. Right? And there's a joy when it's relationship. So you've got the priests who are preparing for Passover while Jesus is in Cana enjoying wine with his followers, you've got the priests going through the motions, right? They're going through the church motions, so to speak. Let's get it all set up. We're setting up the tables. It's another Passover. We're celebrating our freedom. Now, we can't do it too big because Rome will kill us if we do it too big. We're celebrating our freedom, but we got to keep it small. We're celebrating our freedom, but we got to get a permit from Rome. You know, it's not very free. We're celebrating our freedom. We had to bribe Pilate. We had to bribe Herod, but we're free. Now, we don't have the guy coming this year, came last year, because he, he, he was murdered by the Romans. But we're celebrating our freedom. <laughs> right? Like, there's an irony to it. You know? I'm free. No, you're not. You haven't been free in hundreds of years. So we're celebrating the freedom that we lost. That's a terrible, terrible holiday. <laughs> right? Independence. Can you imagine celebrating Independence Day, but we're under another country? Like, the 4th of July is going to lose its meaning if we're not a free country. Right? Right? And I could, I could go on a tangent, but I'm not going to. I repented of that. We took baths off the sign. And uh, so, uh, I, I, but I could go on a tangent and, uh, and, and preach about America. But no, l- listen, Independence Day wouldn't mean much if you weren't independent anymore, right? If you're not free, it's kind of a lame holiday. We're shooting fireworks off. We bought from China. China owns us. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> all right. So, it would be really disappointing. Well, that's kind of what they're doing here, right? I mean, they're celebrating how they were taken out of Egypt, and now they're under Rome. Good news is I get to live in my home. Bad news is Rome owns it. So they have this, this holiday. Jesus followers, they're coming, and they're joyful. I just saw 120 gallons to 150 gallons of, of water turn into wine. They're joyful. Uh, when there was nothing there, Jesus brought us joy and gave us what we needed. He supplies my needs. And he doesn't just supply like I didn't have a Bible, he gave me a Bible. He supplies like the excess needs. Like, okay, not needs, wants. Like, I just didn't want to look bad in front of the master's ceremonies, and I don't look bad because Jesus bailed me out. Like, this was a stupid decision on my part that I ran out of wine, and Jesus bailed me out. Like, it, it says, you ever pray, and you're like, well, Jesus, you're probably not going to fix this because I messed up. And Jesus is like, no, that's what I do. I fix mess ups, right? I fix mess ups. I don't just fix your holy problems. I fix your sinful problems. I fix sin. That's what I do. 
So this is a, this is a, a mess up on somebody else's. This isn't Jesus' fault. This is somebody else's fault. And he comes in and he fixes it. There's a joy. The disciples are like, man, I, I thought he was just going to read the Bible the whole time and say this was fulfilled and this was fulfilled and this was fulfilled. He turns water into wine. He makes weddings fun. So they go to the Passover celebration, and they're probably thinking, like, we're not really that free. Man, Jesus, he just makes celebrations better, right? That's what they're thinking. And you know what he does? He does not make the celebration better. He goes into the city, goes into the temple, and he's looking around, and he's just getting angry. Right? It's just, it's just coming up. Righteous indignation, because he knew no sin. But he's angry. Hey, uh, Peter, give me, some, uh, give me some of that rope. Take that rope from off that goat's neck. Well, he might get away. Oh, he's not the only one that's going to be running in a second. Give me that rope. Right? Okay, give me your belt. My belt? I, just give me your belt. Okay. You know? Well, this will do. Just starts braiding. He's just mad. Man, he turned the water into wine. I wonder how he's going to make this party better. <laughs> he's going to ruin the party. <laughs> All right? And so he just begins to drive them out. Their idol is money. The, the Greek, I'm told by those who know Greek better than I do, is that he says, you turned the house of my father into the house of trade. And he uses the word house back to back. Um, there's some disagreement on this, but as far as I can tell, I think there's a, a great case that this is the first of two times that he does this in the temple. The next time he does it, they kill him. Okay, he does it the last week of his life, and it seems like he does it the first week of his ministry. Kind of brackets his whole ministry with these two times. This time he does it, they don't know what to do. They're kind of, who is this guy? The next time he does it, they had already conspired against him, and they're ready to kill him. They just didn't know he would do it again. Like he would go in and say, you've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. This is supposed to be my father's uh, house of prayer. So he starts the ministry off with the celebration at the wedding and, uh, and makes the wedding better. And the celebration of Passover, and he makes their celebration, well, he exposes it. He exposes it. This has been, I think, one of the interesting parts of this journey for us as a church. It's because we're striving for authentic. We've had to kind of expose the lifelessness of our own worship. And, and then, because I get the privilege of talking to pastors, um, sometimes I tend to point out the hypocrisy and idolatry and unchristlike motives for what maybe they're experiencing in their churches. Like when a pastor's like, well, I'd leave, but I can't afford not to. Like that speaks to faithlessness to me. I'm not saying it's hard or not hard. I get it. It's very difficult to make a decision that's going to hurt you financially. But if you serve God, no man can serve two masters. You can either serve the Messiah or mammon, Messiah or money. If you serve money, you don't serve Messiah, right? So, so if, if, we're, if our church is run by money, then it's not run by Holy Spirit. I'm not saying it's easy. It's tough. But a lot of us, we, we've had to kind of look inwardly and say, you know what? Jesus really isn't my God because he's not the one who I look to to make my decisions. My boss, my family, my friends, my culture, and the seasons of life all influence how I make decisions. But Jesus, you can have my heart if you want it. You got it until noon. <laughs> then I'm hungry. Then it's football, right? Then it's work tomorrow. Like, if you want my heart, you get, you get, you get space in my heart that you can rent. But ultimately, you don't own my heart. And so I think, I think every reviving work that God ever does, every revival work he ever does, begins with him exposing the poverty that's found in the church. And every generation has got to stop and say, have we lost what God promised us? And so if you go into church and it's lifeless and it's powerless and it's fruitless, well, it's godless. It's Passover. I'm going to church today. There's something different in the air. It's Sunday. Hallelujah. The Lord is, the Christ the Lord is risen. He's risen indeed. Yes. So we're going to go to church. But I'm in bondage of pornography. My marriage is a D minus on a good day. My kids don't love Jesus and can't wait to turn 18 to get out of church. Like, right, these, these are the real matters, right? Just like the, the Jews had to acknowledge Rome owns us. We're celebrating a freedom that we lost. 
The church has to wake up and realize that when they assemble on Sunday, they need to repent, repent the poverty, the strife, the bickering, the politics in the church. I'm not talking about Republican, Democrat, although that's a problem too in the church. I'm talking about the politics of who's closer to the pastor and, 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 and this family has more power than this family. The strife, the, it, it's, it's sick. It's a work of the flesh that's in the church. And Jesus says, I, I see what's going on. This was my father's house. This is a house of purity. This is a house of glory. This is a house where my father said, I will dwell. Of all the places in the universe he could have dwelled, he chose to dwell here in the Holy of Holies. And you're selling things and you're exchanging money and mammon is your God. This is the glory's house, the father's house of glory, the house of prayer. Get out. Get out. And he makes that whip and they're stunned by his passion. Passion for my father will consume me, the psalmist said. And he drives them out. And they're stunned. He's knocking the marketplace over. He's chasing the animals out. Money is scattering on the ground. He's kicking men over. They're stunned by what he's doing. They don't know how to respond. There's a a lunatic in the house. Why is he a lunatic? Because he's the one guy in the house of the father who loves the father. And it's crazy. You can go to church and be called a lunatic because you're the one guy in the house who's passionate about prayer are passionate about Jesus. I want a church filled with lunatics, right? Everybody's just passionate about Jesus. And if the devil tries to come in, we run him out. Run, devil, run. He's placed all things under my feet. And so there's, there's this passion that comes out of Jesus. And, and so they go to celebrate, right? It kind of parallels the, cup, the, the marriage, but he's exposing the old. And when they go to celebrate, he turns their joy into mourning. He exposes a corrupt system, a house full of idols. And then he makes a prophecy. The guy's like, what right do you have to do this? First of all, you lost us a lot of money. What right do you have to do this? If you are who you say you are, do something. And he says, okay, tear down the temple. And in three days, I'll build it back up. In other words, he makes the most profound and significant prophecy of his life. He doesn't say, I'll walk on water, I'll turn a Jewish boy's lunchable enough to feed 5,000. He says, I will rise from the dead. I will rise from the dead. It took 46 years and 18,000 people, 18,000 people, to move rocks that were as heavy as 70 tons with no hydraulics, move 70 70 ton rocks. We still don't know how they move some of the rocks they put in place. You can go and see a stone that's longer than this church building and, just, and about as tall. You say, how do they move it? We still don't know. All the, all the machinery we have today, we don't have any machines that can move a rock this big. But they built it back then. 18,000 people were involved in a 46-year period to build this temple. And Jesus is like, three days, I'll build it back up. First of all, it's going to take them longer than three days to tear the old temple down, right? But they're, they're expecting a new temple. The, the uh, a tradition of the Old Testament scribes was that there's going to be a new temple. Ezekiel prophesied a temple that was much bigger than Herod's, and everyone really hated Herod's temple. Herod had taken what Ezra and Nehemiah added to, and, uh, and he, had, he had made it grander to appease the Jews. So they kind of saw it as just this nasty, uh, uh, unholy union of, of, of Herod messing with God's house. So they hated it. It was this monstrosity. It was, a, it was just an ugly building in their eyes, a perversion, a corruption. And so with Jesus saying, I'm going to tear it down, in one sense, they're like, yeah, great, tear it down. We hate it too. Three days? You're crazy. But Jesus is saying, there's going to be a new temple. I'm going to inhabit my people. I'll rise in three days, and I'll create temples of worship. Now, if Jesus visited your heart like he visited the temple that day, would he have to make a whip? Right? Right? Paul said, we are temples of the living God. So if Jesus comes to my heart, it's a worship time. It's time to celebrate Jesus. Uh, you know, 10,000 reasons to worship you. And Jesus says, okay, I'm coming in. What's he going to find in your heart? What's he going to find in your heart? You've turned my temple into a place of trade. You've turned my temple into a place of diversion. You've turned my temple into a place of perversion. What's Jesus going to find? when he comes into our hearts. What do we learn from, uh, from this, this story quickly? 
Number one, we see a God of extravagant grace and generosity. We see a God of extravagant grace and generosity. The water and a wine story reminds me that no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. Psalm 84, right? No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. There's joy and pleasure and happiness in his presence. The joy of the Lord is found in his strength. The joy of the Lord is found in trusting him. The joy of the Lord is found in believing his promises. That's the joy of the Lord. I find joy, new wine, when I'm with Jesus. I was saved when I was five, but I didn't have joy in the Lord until the, until the last few years. In the last few years, God has given me joy because he's taken the word that was in my heart and he's made it alive with his Holy Spirit and he's made himself real to me and I've had encounters with him and I walk with a person because that's what he is. He's not a set of behaviors. He's not a set of laws. He's a person. He's a man. He loves us. He has uh, brought us into the family through adoption and so now he introduces us to, to Papa, to Abba Father and we spend time with uh, uh, getting affirmation and, and affection from our Father God. And so there's joy in His presence. There really is new wine. I, I don't drink. I, I've got my opinions on it. I think it's really hard to be filled with the Holy Spirit if you're filled with other spirits. I think there's a reason they're called spirits, and so I think there's some issues there. I don't argue with those who do. I have friends who do, and I thank God for them and praise God for the fact they love Jesus and Jesus loves them. I don't have one ounce of judgment for them, and if I did, I got rid of it. And, uh, and so, I, I, but I, I, don't, I don't. I don't have a place for alcohol in my life. God spoke very clearly to Candace and myself about it. It was a personal decision we had to make for us. It's not a mandate on our church. It's not a mandate on any of you. But for us, we've chosen to live like Paul describes in 2 Corinthians, which says, I, I live in such a way that no man would have a reason to justify his sin by my life. And so we live above board because we believe that God has some things for us if we choose to live that way. And so it is a sacrifice, and it is different, and we understand that. But I want to be so filled with the Holy Spirit, I don't need other spirits. I don't want to have to cope. I don't want to have to take the edge off. I don't want to do any of that. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. That's what I want. And if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, people are going to accuse me of being crazy and drunk anyways, even though I don't drink. We were noticing that when Saul got filled with the Holy Spirit unexpectedly in, uh, in the Old Testament, he fell down, and then he ripped his clothes off. He prophesied naked. I just thank God we can stay clothed. Hallelujah. And uh, man, it get awkward. But I don't. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit so I don't need other spirits. And if I feel like I need something to take the edge off, I think that's an alarm in my own spirit for me. I'm talking for me. Alarm in my own spirit that says, I need prayer. I need the people. I need the body. I need to be blessed. I need to be built up with the body through their spiritual gifts. I need to rest in Jesus. I need his spirit to be poured in. But, but what about, we'll talk about another day. And so I, I feel a peace with the Lord. But God is a God of extravagant grace and generosity. God loves it when we rest. God loves it when we enjoy our families. God loves vibrant friendships. God loves laughter. He loves celebrations. He loves smiles. He loves happiness. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. God loves our joy in this church. He loves the excitement our church has. That's, what, that's who he is. He's a joyful and extravagantly gracious God. That's who he is. So there's this kind of like a, a struggle that some of us had. Maybe if you come from a conservative church background, you struggle with like all the stuff that looked fun was forbidden. Right? It was like serving God was like the right clothes, the right music, right, and, 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 and just be in church. I was giving some of my money away. You know, I was just, it's always like I'm just giving and, 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 and just, I had to, you know, I just didn't feel it. We, we, we want to know, I want you to understand that God values and loves and gives generous things to us. He loves your relationships. Husbands, wives, he wants you to find such joy in each other. He wants you to find such joy in each other. He loves your life together, your joy together, your happiness together. He wants to foster that in your life. He wants to help you with that. He loves joy. He doesn't like miserable churches. He's as miserable in them as we are. He doesn't like miserable, joyless, unhappy churches. He doesn't like boredom in the church. When, when, when the church is run out of wine, he'll bring more if they'll ask. But what he doesn't want is people all drinking water and pretending it's wine. 
right? Well, that church was good, was it? If you could have gone somewhere else, would you have? Well, probably. Then it wasn't great, right? Just to my kids I talked, like, first couple of years of church, we were like, man, we'd invite people, out, we always tease each other, invite people and give disclaimers. We meet in a small church, it's a small building in Mason, and, and honestly, we're still figuring things out, and, by the time we're done with disclaimers, we're like, we're not going to go either. And, uh, you know, like, it's just, not very, it's just not very good. We don't like it. You know, you go to church, you're like, hide from that person. They're angry. Oh, don't talk to that person. You know, it's just like, you're like maneuvering. And, and man, that's just, that was good. Was it? I'm glad it's over. <laughs> that's just not what God has for us. I know there's seasons where we grieve. There's seasons where someone's hurting in the church, and we kind of grieve together. And so things can be heavier. I understand that. But if there's just, if the work of the flesh is manifest where it's just strife and it's criticism, it's contention, and it's politics, guess what? It wasn't good. It's not good. It needs to get out. Stop drinking water and act like it's wine. So we, we serve a God of extravagant grace and generosity. Okay? Second one, other side. And lastly. We see a God of absolute holiness and purity. So we got to keep these two in mind. Jesus is at this wedding. He rejoices at the wedding. He brings joy and mirth and happiness to the wedding. He relieves those who are stressed. He imbibes those who need a little bit more. And then he goes to the temple and he says, My father is a holy father. And there's this, like, so when we hear holiness, our flesh automatically goes back to joyless. You can be joyful and happy and holy, okay? That's important. If when you hear holy, you're like, oh, I can't watch my favorite TV show. Ah, holy means I can't enjoy the things of the world. And you haven't found the joy of Jesus. And we're not like, again, we're not saying, we're not acting, talking about water and acting like it's wine. It really is wine. There really is a joy in Jesus. There really is a smile, a relief, a peace, a hope, an excitement, a celebration, a joyfulness in knowing Jesus. When we're worldly, we can't understand holy. And so when you talk to a worldly person about holiness, you say, well, what is worldliness? It's lust of the eyes, lust of the, of the flesh, and pride of life. It is feeding my eyes and feeding my flesh and feeding my ego. That's worldliness. So when I'm feeding my flesh all the time, hours and hours and hours and hours of consuming the world's entertainment, and then a preacher talks to me about holiness, I can't handle it. Like, it freaks me out because all of the ways I spent my time last week would have to change. It's overwhelming. Right? Like, if you watched 30 hours of television last week, and movies, and spent time browsing your favorite social media sites, like all of that, would it, you just get overwhelmed when you're worldly, because that's what the devil does. He wants to overwhelm you so you won't change. But what Jesus wants you to do is just encounter him. Don't worry about the stuff you have to give up. That's not what we're going to talk about right now. Just meet Jesus. Just wherever you're at, whether you were saved at five and you lost it, you've never been saved before, he wants you to meet Jesus. If you just get in front of Jesus and you encounter him, he will slowly change your desires and your appetites. So I'm learning as a pastor, to not rail so hard on the worldliness, because when I do, the worldly person just gets overwhelmed, right? Stop doing it. (sighs) Then what would I do? And uh, no, I just want you to meet Jesus, but he's holy. Now, for those of us who feel like we have been filled with the Holy Spirit, we never want to forget that first word in the name. We never want to forget holy. I am a vessel for the Holy Spirit. When we first started this journey, I read a book uh, by R.T. Kendall called Pigeon Religion. Great title. Book's like, eh, and, uh, and not his best. And, uh, and, but he talks about, he's got some good ones. He's written 60, which is 60 more than I've written. So I can critique one or two of them. And, <clears throat> but he talks about the difference between a pigeon and a dove. And it, it really actually, in a corny way, it really helped me understand the idea of being holy. So I had been filled with the Holy Spirit and had just such joy. I felt like God had delivered me from some things. You've heard my testimony, uh, most of you, many times. But just delivered me from some, some darkness, some discouragement, and some roots that had to be taken out. And so I had this joy, but I would still talk the old way. I would talk, you know, the old, like, criticize people who aren't like you, even if they love Jesus. Tear them down. Condemn. Judge so that you can be judged. And, you know, I would just, it would, and, and, and so my wife and I were talking one day, and one of us, because we just read the book, was like, I think the dove just flew away, you know? 
Right, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove. Doves are really sensitive. So the whole point of Kendall's book is to talk about how, you know, uh, uh, this family, they had a dove living above their door in Jerusalem, and they found that if they slammed the door, the dove would fly away. So it changed how they opened and closed the door. It changed how they talked, because when they raised their voice, the dove would fly away. It tells the whole story. And so you've got to respect, you've got to live in such a way, change your life in such a way that the dove will be resting on you and won't leave. And then he points out all the things that cause the dove to fly away. And I was like, check, yeah, I do that. Yeah, yeah. like the whole list, I'm like, oh, nine out of 10. And, uh, and so learning to recognize that the words and thoughts and actions that of my old life have got to change because I'm trying to host the Holy Spirit well. As a church, we just want to host the Holy Spirit well because we know that when he's here, he does things. I want him here so he'll work. If he's not here, he won't work. I don't want a place, I don't want, I don't want a church, the Holy Spirit's outside the window and he's watching, right? I don't want him outside the window watching us, Then I wish he'd let me in. But there's strife, there's criticism, there's posturing, and so the Holy Spirit stays outside. I want to host him well. And, uh, and so God is extravagantly gracious, but he's also absolutely holy and pure. And so we balance those two as we look at this text. And we just praise the Lord. Now listen, Paul said this. I strive to live in holiness. But in the same passage, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm winning in life because of God-given holiness. So the holiness comes from God, and then I keep it. That's how it works. So you can't make holiness. You don't create holiness. You don't say, today, I'm going to be more holy. That's not what holiness is. A holiness comes out of our love for God, our desire to host him well. That, that brings God-given holiness. So when you go to God in prayer, and before you even ask him what he wants, you start saying, God, this is what I'm going to do to be holy. You missed it. You go to the Lord and say, Lord, I just love you, and I, just, I want you to fill. I want you to inhabit my life, and in, I want to abide in you, and you abide in me, right? John 15, 7. I want, I want to be that. I just want to be totally connected with you, Lord. I just want to love you. I want to spend time with you. And so I just, I just dedicate myself to getting to know you. And Lord, if you, if you have something you want to change in my life, I open my life up to you. You can change it. When you do that, that's when God-given holiness comes because he begins to slowly and gently correct you. What he usually does is he has you fall madly in love with Jesus and you spend so much time with Jesus that you look back and say, you know those things I used to do I don't do anymore because I'm spending with Jesus. I should just cancel that subscription. <laughs> I don't need that because I spend so much time with Jesus. And so he, he brings you into love and in that love he gives you a gift of holiness and then he wants you to, to foster it, to foster it. So let's take some time to pray this morning and just thank the Lord for his extravagant grace and also just ask him to help us draw deeper into hosting his presence.